thank you so much for your attendance in today's uh, session. Uh, this is a very important topic uh, for both Texas and the nation, and indeed for our representative form of government. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, election integrity today, and joining us on our panel are three individuals who have a very direct experience uh, in both the on-the-ground issues of election integrity, uh, both in Texas and nationally, uh, as well as uh, the policy prescriptions as to what ought we to do about, uh, about this in trying to have our elections be as free and fair as possible with as much participation uh, as possible, but as well uh, with uh, breaks against uh, fraud and abuse. So joining us today, uh, we have uh, Jay Christian Adams, He's the president and general counsel of the Public Interest Legal Foundation, which is a public interest law firm devoted entirely to election integrity. Uh, if you were with us during lunch, you saw him as part of our video. You'll want to remind him of that, though, because he's one of these people who loves to see himself on video. Um, he served from 2005 to 2010 in the voting section at the United States Department of Justice. He was appointed by President Trump to the Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity. And he has a law degree from the University of South Carolina School of Law and is a member of the South Carolina and Virginia Bars. Representative Stephanie Click uh, was elected to the uh, House uh, District 91 in 2012. She's uh, been chair of the Tarrant County uh, Republican Party for six years, currently sits on the House Committee on Human Services and serves as chair of the House Committee on Elections, chair of the House Republican Caucus and the treasurer of the Texas Conservative Coalition. She earned her Bachelor of Science in Nursing at Texas Christian University and has over 35 years of nursing experience. Uh, also joining us uh, is Omar Escobar. Omar Escobar, Jr. is a district attorney in Starr County, Texas, but your district also represents uh, other counties as well. And what I find very compelling about Mr. Escobar is uh, he is a reformer. Uh, he took on the, the system wasn't expected to win, and he won in the Valley. Uh, and it's so important to our republic, to our way of life, that we have honest uh, public servants. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it shouldn't be like a revelation, right? This isn't like, oh, gee, you know, aren't you privileged to have honest and fair representation? <laughs> you know, excuse me. Th that ought to be the default, right, not the exception. And so um, I am uh, greatly uh, honored that he's joined w uh, us today. Uh, I first saw um, uh, uh, District Attorney Escobar when he was giving testimony before the state Senate on a bill uh, this last session uh, that would have improved some of the weaknesses within our electoral system. Uh, and I thought, this uh, is a man of moral courage and uh, was just absolutely delighted to see his testimony. Uh, and he, too, I understand, loves to see himself on video. Uh, and you probably saw him uh, in, in our uh, film that we showed uh, before lunch. So without any further ado, I'd like to get this uh, uh, panel started. So if we can, I'd like to start with the district attorney, uh, Escobar. Could you tell me just a little bit about what you faced in your first successful election? Well, at that time, I think, you know, it's it's a system that exists, I think, probably in the Valley and, you know, not just in the Valley, but other parts of Texas, is that, you know, there, there exists a system of, of workers that um, really have tapped into mail-in voting. And so they're going to have a certain number of votes that, uh, that they're going to have sort of in the bag. And... It, they would be in the bag because they have contact with them often, either through a food pantry or through some other social services. And so uh, as a result of this contact, these workers, we call them politiqueras, uh, you know, they're able to kind of say, go to different politicians or whoever may be, look, we, we have this and we can deliver this, these captive voters. Usually they're going to be elderly voters. These are persons that may not otherwise, you know, um, care or they might be afraid to lose whatever benefit they may be offering. So that system ex is going to exist either in different pockets of a county or in counties. And so 
whenever you're running, you're a new candidate, you're sort of forced with, well, you're, you're either going to play with that, you know, you're going to be in that system or you're going to fight it <laughs> one way or the other. And so, you know, it, it, it becomes a tall task, especially when, it, when it's mail-in voting. That's how it goes. So, um, Mr. Adams, uh, this, is, this is not just like a local uh, problem in Texas. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience, about what you've seen around the country? Right. Is this on? Yes. Good, good afternoon. Um, as Chuck said, I was at the Justice Department, and when I was there, we did a case in Mississippi that is a lot like what the DA uh, is talking about. But all over the country, you have a problem. Actually, on your seats is a study we did called Safe Spaces. All we did is ask for uh, records of non-citizens registering to vote, ones who have confessed as non-citizens, particularly in, in sanctuary cities. The biggest threat to the integrity of our elections are not voting machines, okay? They aren't voting machines being controlled from outer space or, or France. They're non-citizens getting on the rolls and voting, and their paper ballots in the form of absentee ballots are being manipulated through intimidation. Those are the two biggest threats to elections in the country. And we see it going on all over the country, but I will tell you, a lot of it really is going on in Texas. So Representative Click, I understand that when this issue is brought up, there's often uh, pushback that uh, would be in the form of, of uh, advocates saying that, that you're engaged in voter suppression and, and you really don't want everybody to vote. Could you talk a little bit about some of the, the political arguments that you hear when uh, reform legislation is proposed? It's much like uh, requiring voter ID is racist, yet we are required to get our prescriptions filled and show ID. You go to the emergency room to receive care. You're frequently asked to see your ID. Uh, many, many other things uh, in the course of your everyday affair, you have to have ID. Uh, so, you know, it's not racially motivated. It is to ensure that people that are legally permitted to vote, their votes are not diluted by someone who votes that's not authorized to vote. And yet, with the mail-in ballot process in Texas, is there, a, is there a voter ID requirement in that chain of custody? At current, currently, there's not, because those voters, many of them are over 65 uh, and quite frail, and some of your seniors may not actually still be driving. Right, but then the state does offer like a non-driver's license ID, That's correct. ID, right? There is a voter right. ID that one can get. So uh, back to Christian Adams. So have you seen in different states uh, different reforms that you would recommend? I mean, what do those look like? What, what does right look like if you're going to take on the two problems that you mentioned? And I'd imagine there's very different things that you have to do for the two different things you mentioned. Well, look, you cannot underestimate the amount of money opposing anything that's done, OK? The left has this huge network of funding, of litigation, of resources devoted to stopping any reform. So this is not just a what's a good idea issue. This is a this is war issue. Because the left will spend this money, as they have in Texas. As some of you here know, uh, the Justice Department under Holder was going after Texas for everything they did, from redistricting to voter ID. The left is going after Texas for limiting deputy registrars that they brought cases there that had to go to the Fifth Circuit. Uh, so you got to understand, any reforms you do are going to be at, uh, attacked by this huge apparatus that the left has to attack reforms. That being said, one of the smartest things was ever done was in South Carolina. When they passed their voter ID law, they included a affidavit of, of uh, hardship, OK? Uh, affidavit of hardship. And that single thing got justice then Judge Kavanaugh when it went, because you all used to be underneath the Section 5 preclearance regimen. The Justice Department used to have to approve everything. When I was there, I used to approve Texas things. So this singular affidavit of hardship. So if you didn't have ID, if you're born to a midwife, 
You could just fill out an affidavit at the polls and vote. That's what got South Carolina voter ID to pass. Now, a lot of the most hardcore uh, activists hated it. Like, oh my gosh, this is going to open the floodgates. But in order to, to take the air out of the sails of the left, you sometimes have to do things like that. And that's what happened in South Carolina. The other thing, Chuck, real quick, backdoor citizenship verification. Backdoor, in other words, let them register to vote. We've been litigating on the front door side to, to prove citizenship, but we're losing because of the judges. But do backdoor. Once you get registered, do checks. Now, what happened here in Texas, oh my golly, that's a whole other to topic panel. Maybe we can do it on Sunday. Uh, huge mistakes were made in Texas on that backdoor citizenship process, which I'm happy to talk about. But one of the things we got to do is get it right. Because every time we get it wrong, the left scores another victory here. So I'd like to uh, take it to um, uh, District Attorney Escobar and ask the, the, the following, and, and first set it up by saying, so, as some of you know, three years ago, now four years ago, uh, so two sessions ago, uh, the legislature tightened up the rules for ballot harvesting in Texas. Uh, it didn't completely eliminate it, uh, made it a little more um, accountable. Uh, but interestingly enough, in my old home state where I was a lawmaker, the same year Texas improved its system, California adopted what we discarded in Texas. So California enacted exactly what we outlawed. Now, what's interesting about that is that is it unlike your experience in the Valley and other parts of Texas where uh, the rules are exploited, and this is what I wanted to ask you about, to, to uh, move local elections? The way it worked in California was rather than try to just win a local uh, sheriff's race or DA race or a school board race, city council race, they commercialized it and weaponized it statewide. And you had a lot of money coming in from Tom Steyer and and Soros that paid for tens of thousands of people to do this across the entire state and flip several state legislative and congressional districts. Now that's very different though, and so what I wanted to ask the district attorney was, tell me some of the practical implications of what happens when, let's say, a majority of three people win corruptly at the city council or school board level, or let's say become sheriff, based on bogus votes. What, what has been the damage? What have people done with that? Well, first off, let me, let me just address uh, the issue of the mail-in uh, verification. There is no verification for ID. There's none. There's no mechanism for it. On the back of the carrier envelope, you can put your identification number, and there's nobody that can really verify anything. Uh, so there is no verification of any... It's not like going in to write the polling location with an ID and they're going to check your ID. Nobody's going to check. There's no way, there's no mechanism for actually checking whether the person that is mailing or that's on the carrier envelope is actually the same person that's voting. There's no way. There's not. And so that, I just want to clarify that, that there's, there's no mechanism for doing that. Um, so, you know, practically speaking, what you're asking, it seems to me, is well, what are the effects of election fraud? Well. The, election, the effects there are that you're going to have people that are going to take over local government in one way or the other and are going to end up exploiting probably at the end of the day taxpayer money in one way or the other and it's probably going to be for self-interest. And so that, that really is, I mean, that really is the issue. They're going to go and, and they're going to take office and of course they're going to do what, they, uh, what they're probably not supposed to be doing. And so, what, so one of the things that, that we have seen and I think it's a discussion that, that I've had before with some other prosecutors and some from the AG's office is that when we think about election fraud and we, we talk about these laws, for example, some of them that, that address voter harvesting and um, election fraud and uh, you know the similar laws that, that have been passed, we have to understand one thing, that they are on the books. Sometimes enforcement becomes tricky. And if you think about it, when are you actually going to get a chance to investigate an election fraud case? Many times it's going to be during an election contest, when there's depositions or when there's actual trial testimony. Otherwise, if you just send out people randomly, investigators will go ask this, of course you're gonna get attacked by civil rights people uh, immediately. 
And so you have to have an election complaint first before you have an investigation. Well, then you're going to have an investigation. After the investigation, you might get an indictment. And then after the indictment, you're going to end up in court. Now, how long is this going to take? So we're going we're to end up two years after fraud happened to go back and say, well, there was fraud in this, in this particular election. By that time, somebody who's not in office has already been in office for two years. So what's the remedy? What was the point of, what's the point of the penal laws in the first place? And that, that's part of, what, part of the discussion is, well, then what are we doing? We may end up punishing the person who did it, but the person who's in office, what happened? They've already been in office making decisions, budgetary decisions, spending decisions that should not be there in the first place. And how do you go back and remedy it? You don't have a time machine to do this. So how do you go back? And that's one of the things that we're, one of the challenges for us as a community, as a state, and as Americans is that we're going to have to figure out how we prevent voter fraud not try to try to use these laws afterwards, the threat of prosecution to somehow prevent it. That's going to be as effective as, let's say, our drug laws have been to curbing drug use. It is, to me, it becomes a question of what are we willing to do to make sure to prevent it, not try to come in afterwards and prosecute it. And we had a discussion this last session uh, with the AG's office and say, look, we need to start looking at how do we start preventing fraud while it is happening or before it happens, before it affects an election, before they take office, when they shouldn't be in office in the first place. Right. Yeah. So Representative Click, if you were to look at some of the reforms that you've seen proposed in the last few years, as well as your own ideas, uh, can you give us like a general uh, kind of a categorization, in other words, you know, column A, column B, column C, are there certain types of reforms that you believe there is a growing consensus in the Texas legislature to, to examine and potentially to pass? There were actually some reforms that we uh, passed last session. I think one of the most important, and it kind of goes to equipment, is our electronic poll book uh, legislation. And why that's important is, you know, we're talking about voting uh, by mail, but without those regulations, somebody could go and vote in multiple locations because they, there was no requirement for real-time live updates to make sure that you don't have somebody voting in multiple locations uh, on, in an election. The other thing uh, that we uh, did during session uh, is I got funding for us to participate in a cross-check program, uh, which I think will help us uh, clean our list. You know, most people, if you've moved in the last year, do you actually cancel your voter registration? Probably not, most people don't. Uh, and that will cross-check our records with other states. Uh, there are have been instances when individuals uh, have impersonated another voter uh, by using their ID because they know they're either dead or no longer around. So, you know, list maintenance is hugely important uh, to avoid the risk of fraud. Let me ask, though, and this may be both for you, uh, Representative, and, and for uh, Mr. Adams. If, if you listen to one of the concerns uh, that was laid out by District Attorney Escobar, about when you have fraud occurring. You see there's like evidence of fraud occurring before the election, right? There's, hey, this doesn't look right, right? And you're getting some complaints. What are the mechanisms that we have in place to either prevent that and to treat the ballots that are suspect perhaps to quarantine them? Uh, or, because my understanding is, if, if they get mingled with the, general, with, with the general pool of ballots, that's it. You can't separate it. You're, you're done, right? The election is going to be thrown. So is there any, is there, what are the specific Texas mechanisms, whether it's the attorney general, whether it's the secretary of state, whether it's the county level, is there anything that exists that can allow us to, if we spot something coming, to try to stop it? And if not, how can we fix that? I think that it's important for voters that are observing things that they believe uh, are contrary to the law that they need to report it, number one. Uh, it's, it's interesting to me in the different capacities that I've had, I will find out somebody will see me in two, 
tell me a story about two years later of a problem. You need to not wait. You need to report it immediately. You can report it to your local DA or you can go on uh, and report it to the Texas Secretary of State's office. Uh, it, don't wait. Get it done now. Chuck, it's way worse than that. I mean, that's, there's no, let me, let me first start. The federal government, when I was the Justice Department, the Federal Prosecution Manual for Investigating of Election Crimes has a freeze. By policy, you don't investigate it before the election. Second problem, almost no district attorney offices except one <laughs> has any idea how to do these investigations. Okay. And who, that, who might that one be? I don't know. Okay. The All third right. problem is there's a culture problem where the left has changed the culture about voter issues to such a degree that so many DA offices who get a complaint don't want to go anywhere near it. Not only do they not know how to do it as a lawyer, they're scared to do it as a victim of the cultural onslaught by the left. So there's no easy fix. Let's just flip a switch. It's a cultural problem, and it's a much bigger one than just finding neat solutions to report. It's, it's way bigger. All right, so... so <laughs> <laughs> Twist your arm. No, no, th there's a lot more to this that, Please. That, that the average person doesn't know as far as how the mail-in vote is actually processed. So the mail-in is going to... So the applications are going to go out to the Elections Administration Office. They're going to get processed. Assume for a moment that they actually go through uh, the procedure there for just kind of, they look at the application, they say, okay, the person says disabled. Well, let's, let's talk about just that process to begin with. They check off the box disabled. So I know Mr. Ingram is sitting in the audience here. We've had this discussion for years now. They check, they, they're going to check off disabled, all right? Elections Administration Office is going to get this application, is going to look at it, and they have no way at all to verify whether that person is disabled under Texas law. They have to take it as is. That's it. Well, th at least that has been the opinion. And I don't blame um, SOS for taking that position because, of course, if they take a different position, they're probably going to be met with a whole bunch of lawsuits in federal court. So... What ends up happening, elections administration, all the local administration officers are going to do the same thing. They look at it. It says disabled. I'm not going to question it. I'm going to send it out. The politiquera, by the, by the way, is telling people out on the street, you can vote with the comfort of your own home. All you have to do is just check this box that says disabled. I'm going to check it for you, as a matter of fact. All you got to do is sign. So we sign it. And that's one other vote that the politiquera has. You can't even question it. Now, we've had... Firefighters, we've had teachers, we've had everybody that you can think of mark off disabled, and these people were looking at it, and the elections administration office, it, it, uh, I mean, our elections administration was brave enough to call me and say, hey, Omar, um, I've got an issue. What, what's your issue? This was before the election, 2018. We got an issue. What is it? Five people of this household are all disabled. <laughs> and everybody's disabled in this house, and I find it highly doubtful that they're all disabled. Now, if we follow that guideline over here, hey, no problem, let's just wait until after the election to start asking questions. I don't care about guidelines, and I don't care what, about what, doesn't, what may be a policy. If it doesn't seem right to me, I am not going to do it, So, and I'm not going to follow it. So in this particular case, he asked me about this. I said, no, 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 this doesn't make sense. So what do we do? Well, we, he, this is something that was brought to my attention, possible fraud. We send out investigators. And then things get interesting. <laughs> Th that's when people start saying, well, the politiquera said, just sign here. I'm going to get the ballot here. I was going to be able to vote from my house. No problem. Well, there is a problem. You lied. Somebody lied on this application. You're not disabled. You are not disabled. So when we started doing that, you started figuring out that a whole, class of, a whole class of people were not actually disabled who wanted to vote from the House. Of course, the politiquera is going to take the ballot as soon as it gets there or somehow or another force them to vote in one way or the other because they're getting paid to this. So understand the process. Just to begin, we already have fraud at the very beginning. A lot of people that should not be voting right. are already voting. Then look at it from this other side. They, they get the ballot. They already get the, get, they get the carrier envelope. They get the ballot. They... They vote it, and they send it back in, okay? 
Now it may get there, it may not. It gets there, now you have a signature verification committee that's supposed to look at the signature on the carry envelope and say, this is the person or it's not the person. It's completely to their discretion. And if they can identify it of possibly being the opposing team, they might kick it out. And you won't find out until that you, your vote didn't count until after the election. You understand? So what actually happened in our case when we started investigating, you had about 2,000 applicants. In our case, it was 2,000 people were, were going to vote by mail, and we've got about 30,000 registered voters. And about of those, maybe 10 to 12,000 will vote at any particular time. You're talking about approaching 20% voting by mail, many of which probably did not qualify to vote by mail. So a lot of people, they started getting somewhat concerned that they had engaged in fraud, so they started canceling their ballot because that's what I told them they need to do. They went and canceled the application and they went and voted in person. So rather than 2,000 voting, it was somewhere between seven to 800, which was a substantial, for Star County, it was a substantial decrease. But it gives you an idea of what, we're, what you're actually dealing with. And so had we proceeded, had elections not proceeded that way, we probably would have seen 2,000 people vote by mail many of which could not have voted by mail. You understand, the, I mean, right. this, this, is, this is a process and it's a problem that if, if we follow what, you know, some of the guidelines are and not asking any questions, you're left with probably a compromised election that you're trying to investigate piecemeal years after the fraud happens. There's, it's untenable, we can't, this, this system cannot, does not work. Tell me about the chain of, of, of the chain of events or of custody. So, it, I think it's important for people, most of whom in this audience probably have not been campaign managers or run for office, right? So, if somebody asks in Texas for a vote by mail ballot, and that ballot is then sent out to the House, do the does the local election authority keep a list of to whom and when those things are sent so that politiqueros or anyone else would know that, hey, right around now is when they're going to get the ballot. It, well, the Elections Administration Office does keep a list, but they're not supposed to be reveal it until after the mail-in is actually received. So they're not supposed to disclose who voted by mail until the ballot is actually is received. So you receive so, back... Right, so back by the election officials or at the house? No, elections and elections administration officials. Okay, so that was meant to try to prevent that, but the reality is that most people who are working on this have their own lists. They don't need the elections administration list. They they know. I mean, most people know who's sixty five years of age or older. You just got to look at the uh, voter registration rules, and you'll be able to tell who's sixty five years of age or older. You can more or less tell who's going to get one by mail. So yeah, I mean, at that particular point, that that they might have a list at elections administration, I don't know that that's really as much of an issue as the fact that the workers themselves already have their own lists. They have repeat and customers, Chuck. Of course, yeah. They keep going back year after year. And there are there is such a thing as annuals. Folks that, you know, every election they're on the annual list. And what you can do, th those folks on the outside, uh, is wait till after the election and find out who voted, and you, through the power of deduction, you can figure that out. So let's let's say um, let, let's just run a scenario uh, briefly that that uh, is uh, more aggressive uh, and more organized, perhaps at a statewide level. Uh, let's uh, imagine for a moment that at some future statewide election, uh, whether this November or you know two or four years from now, that polling seems to indicate that Texas is in play. Uh, and certain groups are willing to spend upwards of you know, 20 to $40 million to try to flip Texas because it would be, it would be determinative potentially in certain national uh, level elections. What are the sort of vulnerabilities in the Texas system you know, now, completely apart from legitimate TV and radio ads and all, you know, d direct mail and internet and all that stuff, what could, what could someone do that, that could exploit some of the weaknesses in our system if they didn't care about, uh, about ethics or following the law? Uh, do you see any problems that are kind of like what the <coughs> district attorney has mentioned at the local level that might be exploited uh, across the state? Well, sure, you take the behavior that 
has been described and you just amp it up in the urban centers. It's that simple. You pour money into doing what goes on in the valley into doing it in Houston, Dallas, San Antonio. That's, that's how you do it. Or El Paso, throw that in for good measure. I mean, look, this goes on um, all over the country. I, I did a case at the Justice Department in Mississippi, uh, an amazing moment where they would actually follow the postal van, right? The well, they weren't called politicaros in Mississippi, but they would follow the mailman, and they'd grab the ballots out of the box, and they'd go in and vote. And I had one of the witnesses at trial, one of the victims, if you will, and the judge, uh, Judge Tom Lee, federal judge in Mississippi, asked a question in the trial. His name was Susie Wood was the witness. And he said, Miss Wood, why on earth did you allow this person to vote your ballot? And her answer, it's in the transcript, you can, you can read it. She said, well, Carrie Kate always knows who the best person to vote for is. It's a cultural issue, and it's not easily solved. So how do, we, how do you, though, distinguish between, as you mentioned in our, our, our video, in which you, you were spectacular, by the way. You, you look marvelous. I didn't um, see it. Um, you kept, kept your eyes closed, huh? Okay, so, so how, how do you, though, distinguish between the legitimate effort to get out the vote, right, to, to, to go out and encourage people to vote, whether in person or by mail, right? Because in different states, of course, things are done. In, in California, where I moved from, you know, over eight years ago, they call them absentee ballots, and and they're approaching 30 or 40 percent, maybe more, of the total uh, uh, vote in any given year is done through absentee. Uh, and the election officials kind of like it that way because it reduces the election day traffic, and you know, it's easier to manage and all that. So certainly, it's legal as you pointed out, for people to perhaps go door to door and encourage people to vote. I mean, I've done it when I've run for office, right? That's called door knocking, right? I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure the two of you have done it, right? So how is that, how, how can you then distinguish between that and something that is something else entirely? I mean, how does that, how can, how can you prevent that? Well, you have just described the most difficult part of the case that I described at USV Ike Brown to get witnesses to admit that somebody else voted their ballot was climbing the mountaintop, okay? And we put them up at trial. And, but the problem is we had the resources of the Justice Department to knock on door after door after door. I can't tell you how many flights to Jackson I made, okay, to get these people to admit this. What goes on behind closed doors is very difficult to crack. And that's why policymakers in the legislature, election officials need to realize the more elections take place with an observer and an election official, the better. The more it takes place in people's kitchens, the worse. That's the bottom line, is okay. don't allow absentee ballot creep as a matter of policy to ever move through the legislature. Okay, well then let's talk about, uh, about how the system has kind of adjusted to what you just said about with election observers. Is it not the case that when Texas passed the reform now uh, two sessions ago, that what you began to see is some of the politiqueros during election day would intercept people in the parking lot going to the <coughs> voting location, going into the precinct, and saying, hey, you look like you need assistance, right? right? You need assistance. And under the, uh, my understanding is, under the Voter Rights Act. Section 203. The, the, the precinct voting officials cannot question if somebody is there to offer assistance, right? I mean, you can have someone that you know reads and writes and speaks English, you know they're not blind, right? You, it, and here's somebody next to them, I'm here to assist. Well, how, right. tell, tell me about that, what's going on with that? One of my favorite, actually it's section 208, I got that off. One of my favorite things to trigger a real world audience that's you guys, is to tell you two federal laws. Number one, section 208 of the Voting Rights Act says that you have a right to assistance, just like you described, that if somebody wants to walk into the ballot and vote your ballot in the room on election day, you have a right to have that happen. As a matter of federal law, it could be anybody except your union representative or your employer. That's Section 208 of the Voting Rights Act. Secondly, Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act obligates it to be, if they want, in Spanish. So there's nothing that triggers people more than that first time election observer that says, they voted in Spanish, they didn't even speak English, and someone else voted for them. I'm like, hey, it's federal law, it's protected. Okay, and so it's very difficult to crack. 
We had the same thing in that Mississippi case. And if they're outside the zone, and I don't know what your zone is in Texas, 100 feet. If they're outside the zone, and they're not literally being forced to do it, it's legal activity. Yeah, obviously, that, well, that was the, in fact, we got sued over this, but so uh, in, in Star County, you can imagine a, uh, the courthouse parking lot. For the longest time, you've got this, sort of this 100-foot circle where nobody's supposed to electioneer, and outside of that, you would basically have the, most of the, well, a lot of the parking lot of the courthouse is operating courthouse taken over by election camps. So you'd have barbecue pits over here, and you'd have barbecue pits over here, barbecue pit trailers over here, and you got tents. You take over the whole parking area. You'd just take it over. So anyway, you, so you had several county properties that were election polling locations. The same situation, you'd get, and it turned into sort of the, what we described as a circus. The, the reality is that for most voters, they don't like to be harassed. They just, and especially in smaller towns where everybody knows everybody, you know, somebody might yell, like, hey, you know, and if, and if you don't turn around and give them a thumbs up, then that means you're voting for the other person, and all of a sudden you're going to get harassed. Uh, so uh, about, well, you're not with me. You know, so most people want to avoid that whole thing, and they'd like to just go in and get out, and they want to go vote. Some people prefer just not to deal with any of it. So anyway, what ended up happening is that uh, because they tended to block off some of the, you know, a lot of the parking there, so we had regulations that, uh, apparently made some liberal v very upset, uh, some liberal people very upset, that we would, or the county would designate, they voted on it, would designate that a parking area is for parking and not for electioneering. They, apparently that concept was too much, uh, especially for some attorneys. That they, so anyway, we passed these regulations. Of course, now everything was orderly, and uh, people could go in, attend their government business or to go and vote, whatever it is, they'd go in, they get out, and there was no electioneering in that area. People loved it. Well, what happened? They got sued. Uh, we got sued over the, that there was, they were violating their First Amendment rights to electioneer. They wanted to go and harass the voter. They wanted to go talk to the voter there. And kind of, so the situation is you're going to have workers, or you're going to have people that are going to approach somebody who's just getting off their car before they get off their car, Hey, I need for you to vote for me. By the way, you need assistance. You look like you need assistance. All you got to say is you need assistance. You need because you'd, so you'd have this person. Yeah, okay. They'd walk in there, and their only real job is to make sure that you vote the right way. They're watching how you're voting, and so that you know you've got so mail-in is only part of the problem, and I think at some point the mail-in, the mail-in um, sort of mafia, if you want to consider that, that bec that's going to begin to diminish, and at least at, in Star County, and the more, then you're going to start seeing more of this other kind of fraud happen now, where you're going to have people who are getting assisted that do not need assistance in the polling location. Now, the, uh, the person assisting is supposed to sign an affidavit that they're not going to suggest who to vote for, and of course, that's not likely uh, to be true. So you're going to have the, uh, the person assisting go in there to the polling location, tell the voter, you need assistance, just go say you need assistance, that you want me to assist you, not anybody else. Because the election staff can also help out. But no, no, you need to say that you need me to assist you. Go in, we're going to vote the ballot, and we're going to be out, and, you know, we're all happy campers. So that's, that's the other part of this fraud. Mail-in is just part of it. But the thing about it is that election presiding judges cannot ask, apparently cannot ask, that w uh, whether the person actually cannot read, write, or otherwise understand the ballot. And the moment they start doing that, some have done it. Uh, in other words, hey, wait a minute, what's going on? Do you really need assistance, yes or no? And when, when presiding judges begin to start asking those questions, things get really, you know, everybody starts getting nervous. Well, maybe I don't need assistance. <laughs> okay, well, maybe she did make, and things, everybody starts getting nervous. Uh, all you have to do is just ask that question. Is it, it says that you can't read, write, or understand the ballot. Is that true or not? The moment you start asking that question, people get nervous. I'm in favor of allowing them to, a at the very least, ask. But, I mean, it just makes common sense. But uh, common sense may be too much for <laughs> certain people. Representative? He's talking about people outside the polling place offering to assist voters. 
I've also seen circumstances when election workers, although they are allowed to assist a voter, assist or attempt to assist a voter, that doesn't require any assistance. Typically, somebody elderly, where they will go over and uh, control the device, if you will, uh, and make selections. So it's really important from a security perspective that you have people of both political parties inside that polling place. That helps keep people honest. Well, I'm starting to get a little discouraged uh, uh, listening to this. So let me ask, uh, in the state of Texas, what sort of resources are available that have been uh, uh, basically appropriations, whether at the state level or at, at the level, the local level, where the, the elections have been decentralized and where a lot of the mechanism exists. Uh, do we need more resources for enforcement? What sort of resources do we have in Texas right now that look into this? For example, um, a couple of years ago, our attorney general said that, uh, as, if I remember correctly, that they had one person for the state that was dedicated to pursuing, uh, uh, you know, election fraud uh, uh, prosecutions. Um, does a state of some 28 people need more than one person in the AG's office? I mean, how do we do this mechanically? I know we have perhaps some people who, who are associated with the Secretary of State's office uh, in the audience. We have a lot of engaged uh, citizens. Um, what, what does right look like if we're going to increase enforcement, if we're going to increase it? You know, the amount of time that these cases require to investigate, it's very time intensive. And I would say yes, that there needs to be additional uh, personnel on the investigative end. But I also think that there are some DAs that would be uh, helpful uh, in prosecuting these cases, but they too don't have folks trained uh, to do that type of investigation. And so I think that it would, another approach would be actual training for some of those uh, county attorneys or local right. DAs. Let me ask the uh, District Attorney Escobar, so just from a practical standpoint, you're an elected official, you represent, is it three or four counties? Three counties. How many people live in those counties, and how many, how many staff do you have that are capable of prosecuting cases? Uh, let me tell you, there's just not enough. There's no way. There's no way. So you can try to, I mean, I, I can tell you that, you know, even if we think that, you know, uh, between the three counties, we may be talking about um, maybe close to... Maybe it's going to be under 100,000, whether official and unofficial <laughs> uh, residents. But on voter registration rolls, you're talking about maybe 30,000, another, another 10, another 10. You know, so it, it, it'll be under 70,000 as far as total registered voters. And that's not really the issue. It doesn't matter. We're not going to have enough. And so if you look at it from the statewide level, we're, we're trying the capital murders, sexual assaults, everything else. To dedicate resources to election integrity for us is going to require taking people off right. those cases and start taking on those cases. So how many, how many prosecutors do you have? So in right now, so right now I have three assistant district attorneys and probably I can handle about four at any one time, including myself that I'll get into the courtroom when I need to. And so on some of the you know, capital murder cases, whatever cases we may need, it's not going to be enough. There's no way. And so, so for the AG's office, I've worked with them. I know their capacities. There is no way that they can handle the amount of voter fraud cases in Stark. I mean, in any county and all the counties in Texas, there's no way. So be it, you're, with yourself and potentially a flex attorney, so you have four, up to four right. people plus yourself, that's five. Right. So if you had one person that you put on this, that's 20% of your prosecutorial staff. Right. That, that, that wouldn't be going after violent crime and, and things like that. Right. So, so I've got three right now, and I can handle the fourth. But there's no way. There is a, it's, there's right. absolutely no I way. I just wanted to have s some idea for the scale right. of, of what you're doing. And, you're, and you're talking about now at the state level because most, you see, most of the locals, when they've got an election case, hey, call the AG's office. Call the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State doesn't have an enforcement mechanism. 
that you just get it reported to them. They don't have any. They don't have any teeth. There's nothing for them. That, oh, here's a report. Let's hand it over to these people. And so they got to hand it over either to the local or to the AG's office. In most cases, they're going to hand it over to the AG's office. It falls on the attorney, one of the AG's, assistant AG's that's there, and they kind of decide, okay, well, let me, let me put this on the list of stuff I've got to do and kind of try to send out investigators hundreds of miles to try to figure out right. in a county that they know nothing about, they don't know the locals, they don't know anybody, to try to figure out what happened. There's no, you can't, it's very hard to do this without local resources and, and local will to do this. And the reality is that most DAs or most county attorneys are not going to be willing to spend the time and resources, especially to go after, you know, some of the politiqueras or, you know, the political infrastructure that will likely come after us later on. And so, uh, you know, th th there's going to be a lack of, of, of will, I suppose, for locals to actually tackle it. But right now, th there's n I can tell you, Texas then ha does not have the resources at all to be able to handle uh, the kind of election fraud. You'd have to, I, I mean, you'd have probably, right now, whatever. So if the AG's office has about four assistant AG's, maybe, three to four assistant AG's, they'd pro you'd have to make it like five, five to ten times larger the entire department than what they cur currently have. You can't, the only way to do it is to have local help and com committed local resources to be able to help the AG's office come in. And, and it's just going to be very, very difficult uh, to do that. Here's the good news. Please. <laughs> you guys don't know how good you have it in Texas because there is no other state that devotes the resources to fighting voter fraud that Texas does. Largely because of Ken Paxton. Okay, I'm telling you, there is no voter fraud prosecution going on in the state of Washington, or Oregon, or Hawaii, or Vermont. I'll go down the list. You guys have it as good as it gets in the country. You're at the top as far as resources being devoted to this issue. There's no question That's about the that. That's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is, is you have a place like Harris County that I'm currently suing just to get non-citizen voting records. They won't give them to us. Okay. They, they won't turn over, with, and I guess Senator Betancourt used to be the, the elections, okay? He knows there's non-citizens voting. That's what we used in our complaint was his testimony. And they won't turn him over. We're in federal court fighting that. I guarantee there's no voter fraud prosecution going to go on out of that county attorney or that county office. Interesting. So, go, go ahead, please. Yeah, so, I mean, I, we can have the discussion about here, here's, the, here's the thing about this. I've, I've been at this for years now. And it kind of surprises me from time to Well, it doesn't surprise me from time to So on the other side of the political spectrum, you're going to have people say, no, it doesn't exist. It, fraud is a myth. And, or it's too small to dedicate any. It, to me, that, that, that's absolutely ridiculous. That fraud, election fraud exists. It happens. It is happening. It will happen. And for anyone to say, that it's not it's non-existent and it's somehow a myth that has been created by one side of the political spectrum, I think should completely be debunked because it exists. I, there should be no question at all. Right. And then this idea, I've heard this argument, well, there's not enough. We've got to be working on other issues. We don't, we, know, we don't need to be looking at election integrity. We need to be looking at, let's dedicate our resources to something else. How much election fraud does it really take for us to begin to start paying attention and so for certain liberal groups who want to say, well, there's not enough election fraud happening for us to really turn our attention to, well, how much do you need? Is it when your side begins to lose elections? Is that when it starts mattering or what? And so, and, and so I, I've asked the question is, well, at what point does it, what, what's the quantum of, of proof you need? And, or how much fraud do you need to be shown to actually start attacking it? I'm going to say there's already enough. The question is, how do you address it? And I think... The challenge for us right now is what is the solution? How do we go forward? I mean, one of the, and unfortunately, it's going to take some out-of-the-box thinking. I had some, a discussion with the Attorney General's office um, and others and really to talk about some of the things that, that should be happening. For me, I think that at some point you're going to probably need to use the, the, the civil remedies at some point mm. that is injunctive relief right. for local, either for the AG's office or for local, uh, either county attorneys or district attorneys, or maybe even institute individual causes of action that may be needed to, to invoke in injunctive relief from judges that probably need to come in out of the county to have 
immediate relief. For example, if you think that a particular network of politiqueras and you've got some proof that it's happening, at least enough for injunctive relief, well, you should have a cause of action somewhere or another to be able to get a TRO from and preventing these individuals to, to the extent that you can show it in court, perhaps to get a, a restraining order or some kind of injunction to prevent them from violating the election laws. And if they do not follow the order, then guess what? We have now right. contempt right. at some point. Now you, have got, you, now you invoke the contempt powers of a court before election right. happens. You see, you're going to have to, or, or the other thing that we talked about at some point or another is that in an election contest, if it is shown that a person has engaged, knowingly engaged in election fraud, whether by preponderance of the evidence or clear and convincing, whatever, whatever the standard proof may be, I mean, if, if that election official is shown or person to have engaged in this conduct or whoever is working this, if it is shown, I mean, why should you be able to hold office if you have, in fact, been shown to engage in election fraud? You should be barred from holding office. And yeah. so... Aside from, aside from fines, because we already have that now, uh, it got passed in this, this last legislative session where you can have fines levied for each act of uh, election fraud that is shown. Uh, I think the further remedy is going to be, well, if you're shown to have engaged in election fraud and it, changed the, it possibly changed the, the result, the lawful result, right. uh, then you should be barred from holding office. Why should you profit from the right. election fraud that you were engaged in? So it's time to move to Q&A, but just to be clear, um, you talked about um, the political spectrum, and I want the audience to know, because if I, if I know correctly, maybe what you're referring to as the spectrum is like honest and corrupt, because District Attorney, uh, you're a Democrat, right? A, okay, just to be clear, I'm right? Okay. Hispanic Democrat. All right, I, I was just, I, when you said spectrum, I'm like, what spectrum is he talking about? Oh, I know corrupt and honest. Okay, I get it now. Okay, let's go to questions. So, so we have a microphone. I'm going to ask you because we are streaming, right? So this is your chance to have your close-up, Mr. DeMille. So if you go right over here to the front row, and then just uh, if you can, please state your name and then your question. Okay, Thank uh, you, sir. Chris Miller from uh, 930 AM, The Answer, Chris Miller Show. Um, in San Antonio. Uh, several things that I wanted to discuss real quick. Uh, I'd like to put this in the ethos so that uh, the TPP, TPPF can uh, begin to put together some kind of policy to address this. Uh, what happens when we're being blocked at the polls from doing our constitutional duty of poll watching? Um, so Bear County Republican Chairwoman uh, Cynthia Brim informed my listeners and viewers uh, that the, she did this on my show last week that this was the case in Bear County, that she was actually escorted off the premises because she was just trying to do her constitutional duty. And uh, hmm. so, also, what is the next step after you've brought the infractions to the intention of the Secretary of State, AG, FBI, DHS, and so on, uh, having to do with the voter fraud and the manipulation of the votes at the polls um, via early votes and mail-ins, which is also happening right now? All right, so uh, two big questions so far. Right, and uh, sorry. Um, you you are saying, in radio, aren't you? Yes, okay. And uh, do you have any plans to deal with the culture issues and misinformation that is that the left is pushing, especially uh, to minority voters, about uh, voter rights, because most of it is misinformation and things that they they push on us, making it seem like we're incapable of doing so. Um, also, Floresville had a huge problem with the city council voting to change the election, uh, that changed the time from, uh, illegally, might I add, to thwart the election being um, swayed in Republican favor. Um, they changed it from, I believe, uh, November to May, or vice versa, I can't remember which one, but. They did that illegally. How do we combat that? And uh, all right, so I think we're getting to the point now where go. where we're going to start to forget. So, do, do, who wants to take on first of all the question of of when you have the the right of monitors from different parties to show up at a precinct and to kind of observe? Is that first of all is that allowed in Texas? If it's and and how is that to be done? And what happens if someone's asked to leave under threat of arrest? Uh, you all have a provision in Texas that allows designated observers, right? How do you get designated? How's that? Well, I believe the part of the county, you bunch of ways, candidate. There's a Texas has a candidate or party, ways, right? Um, I worked on a case you guys may have heard of. It involved the new Black Panther Party. Anybody remember that at the justice? Okay, that was a case where they were blocking monitors from getting in in Philadelphia. 
to watch the election. So the other side knows how important monitors are. So what, what, in those cases, what can be done? They can go to court. <laughs> After the fact, though, right? Well, I mean, so it's I, I, they can go right then and try to get yeah. a mandamus to yeah. stop what's happening. You know, we, uh, and it's been a number of years ago, where one of the party chairs in my area was instructing his, his election judge to fire the poll watchers, to <laughs> fire them. And somebody was smart enough to record that. Right. And we called them and said, you do, and we're going to sue so, you. So isn't it, isn't it, though, mechanically correct that if it's the party and or the candidates who designate these individuals, that there probably needs to be some volunteer lawyers, you know, giving pro bono correct. advice, who can then immediately call the proper authorities and threaten them, right? Because if you do something of this nature that is clearly illegal, don't you as a public official put yourself at risk? You absolutely do. All right, so so what about some of the other uh, th things mentioned in, uh, in some of these concerns out of San Antonio? Well look, elections are dramatic things and there's no one size fits all answer. That There's a chain that has to be dealt with in the particular someone being thrown out. I mean, that, you know, a lot of it probably flows up to poor Keith on election day, but there's rules. You don't want to blow things up. I mean, you deal with party officials. You just have to, plus poll worker, poll officials have a big right to throw people out, right? They have a lot of discretion on that score. And I'm not saying they should abuse it. I'm just telling you they have a lot of discretion. So these are very fact intensive questions. Okay, in the back middle uh, there, make it really hard for the person with the microphone to do their job. Um, thank you. Yeah, keep going, keep going. There you go. I was going to say, is it on? Yes. Okay. Um, we participated in well, Could a, you tell us your name first? Oh, Maybe stand up is, so we can see you. And sure. Then, there you my go, thank you. My name is Joy Putnam, and my husband and I participated in a uh, watcher, as being watchers at a, Williamson County uh, counting station, and we were refused entrance. And we um, the we were working with a pack. Uh, Dr. Laura Presley, who is um, got a case here in Texas about uh, voter integrity, and uh, in response to what happened uh, when they threatened to throw us out, we called the constable. And he, um, he read the law, which Dr. Presley had, and, they, um, and then he went back and negotiated, called the Secretary of State, and so we got to go in. Interesting. So in, the, in your case, it sounds like you were working with a, with a political action committee and not necessarily with a party or a candidate, but you were still able to kind of appeal and get back into the... Uh, poll watching. Dr. Presley is okay. uh, uh, driving voter integrity in got Texas. It, got it. Well, go, go ahead. Look, um, the law is the law, and I, you know, the, you're either allowed in or you're not, and so it's not any person who's deciding whether or not you're allowed in. It's just in the code as to who's allowed in. Right. So, so, do you want to take it? But you've also got to, if you are a watcher inside a polling place, there are restrictions that you have to adhere to, or you can be removed. Right. There are certain things that you're going to, that you're allowed to do and not to do, and so it's going to be up to a presiding judge really to the the presiding judge. You have to understand, the code actually says this. Keith is right here. I think the language is it actually exercises the power of a district court district judge inside those 100 feet. So in many ways, it's up to the presiding judge to sort of decide whether your conduct is something that is within the rules and that you are not acting disorderly in some way or another. And so that there's a whole poll watcher handbook and you got to sort of follow those particular rules there. I'm not saying that anybody didn't, but of course, we have to make sure that, that, that that's been followed. That's why it's fact intensive. However, 
It is conceivable that you, have a, you could have a presiding judge that doesn't like a poll watcher being there. And that a presiding judge may just simply decide to say, I want you out. And so they'll call in law enforcement. Of course, they're wearing a gun. You're not. And so uh, they'll say, we want you out. The only real way right now, it, and it's a, it's a curious mechanism under the election code, but the elections, of, at least the DA and the county attorney do have mandamus authority under the election code to enforce election code laws and to force somebody who is an election official to, in other words, apply the law. Now, how, e how easy is that going to be to get your local DA, your county attorney to draft a writ of mandamus and go into a district court and get drag in this presiding judge and say, you know, or you know, tell them, hey, you're, this is what you're going to do. This poll watcher is going to be allowed in here. So there is a mechanism. It's just, it's just very rarely used, but it does exist where if it's egregious enough, you can get a court order to compel them to, uh, you know, to adhere to the law or be, potentially be removed. A district judge is going to have all kinds of authority to work with that. Okay, we had a question here in the middle, the very middle. Thank you. Tell us your name and Sylvia Guzman. Um, so I've served as clerk, poll watcher, election judge, everything. Okay, signature verification, and. I don't understand why we don't do like a national PSA on the ramifications of voter fraud as well as um, uh, what the voter rights are for protecting their vote within the polling booth. And uh, because right now we, I mean, I, I served at a, uh, helped with a campaign in South Dallas where we had Antifa, Black Lives Matter, Muslim Brotherhood, all these different radical, some, you know, more than others, um, groups that were there taking shifts and going all around the city rotations of voter intimidation. And they would literally do like you were saying, where they would get the people and walk them in. They had the judge made the polling workers um, sit at a table far away from where the elections were and it was my training that you were allowed to at least be able to hear if somebody is being influenced in their vote or if their finger is being touched <coughs> if their fingers being used to touch whichever candidate so that the polling worker is allowed to be able to speak and see that it's being and hear vis and, and visually see and hear that that is being so my question is why don't we do some kind of a national PSA campaign for those two issues? Well, um, you know, the president appointed me to be on the Election Integrity Commission. And what it's not, not worth cheering about because we were immediately sued by 12 different lawsuits just to shut us down. Okay? You cannot underestimate, the, and I tried to say this earlier, the amount of power and money against these issues. Has anybody heard of the media consortium? Okay. This is a Soros-funded effort to pay reporters and bloggers to generate the grassroots narrative against the need to fight voter fraud. And I read some memos where the media consortium's work was, they were boasting it had been picked up, quote, verbatim by the New York Times. So to the idea of national PSAs, look, some guy up in Wisconsin put up a billboard that said voter fraud is a crime. That's all he did. You can Google this. This is real. He put up a, a billboard that said voter fraud is a crime, and for the next couple of weeks was this, the victim of every conceivable attack by the left possible because he simply put up a billboard stating a fact. That's what we're up against. I'm doing a PSA right now, but locally, so it's on the front page of at least one of our local newspapers. It'll be on all of, well, in several of our newspapers in our three counties, where basically I talk about most of what we discussed here in as succinctly as we can make it so that people understand what voter fraud is and what you can and cannot do. And I think, but that's me, it's my county. Right. I don't know who else is going to be doing it locally, where we try and then I'm going to go on TV and then go on the radio. So you try to, t look, you can't hand over your ballot to just anybody and sort of talk about the different things, but it takes time and resources to be able to do this. Now, can it be done on a national level? Good luck. Uh, I mean, uh, you're going to have to convince somebody to shell out some kind of money to do, you know, you know, this kind of take on these issues and sort of educate the public on these issues. It requires, uh, you know, right. Well, the thing is, I do it locally. 
the question is, I don't know who else is doing it. So, I mean, I, I know that I'm, I'm trying to explain what you can and cannot do before it happens. And, and so that you can say, well, I wasn't warned. Well, no, no, no. We did everything possible, yet you all still engage in this conduct. Don't tell us that you didn't know. Representative? Doing something nationally would be difficult because you've got s different state laws uh, involved. I mean, California essentially has uh, made it legal to harvest ballots uh, in there. Some states, we've got a couple of states that the only way you vote is by mail. Oregon, right? Yeah. And Colorado's that, that, that's a huge problem. Yeah. There's, I want to share something, I think, uh, and uh, Senator Zaffarini is one of is one of our senators covers our uh, our area, and I remember at one of the uh, one of the events or at least I was testifying at one one of the hearings, and so um, I think perhaps hearing what other states were doing asked the question, Ms. Driscoll, what do you think? It's more of a hypothetical, not that she was actually con you know considering legislation to that effect, but. She, she said, well, Mr. Escobar, what do you think about allowing everybody to vote by mail? And I said, that's going to be a very bad idea to promote that. Uh, and, and obviously, that, that's not something that Texas is going to, that we should have. Right. And so right. The, the, the idea that, that really that, that we need more mail in is, I think, is going to be preposterous. The thing about it is, the irony was that in Webb County, uh, which is Laredo, in Webb County, there was an election, a local election, that was where there was, uh, there was a lot of mail-in voting also. And one of the things that uh, Ms. Zaffarini was uh, troubled by was the mail-in voting. And that the statistics for the in-present voting, those that voted in the, were vastly different than the mail-in. You would think that if you take a random sample, right. the random sample should hold across the entire population. Well, the random sample was not holding on, on where people walked in and voted on their own. You had one, you, one uh, proportion or you one statistical you know, measure. And so for, for each candidate, that was vastly different than the actual sure. mail-in. In and of itself, it's already telling you that's a problem. There, right. it, it, in, it, from a statistical standpoint, You've, get a, you've got a random sample, it should stick. It, it should not be vastly different in mail-in. So, by the way, th this thing about the poll watchers, I, I want you to understand, and we got Keith here. Of course, I don't know if you need to speak on this, Keith, but uh, the poll watching, uh, the availability of poll watching is tapered and changes depending on who you have assisting. Um, because if you have a person, if you chose the person to assist, Poll watching is going to be limited. Is that right, uh, Keith? And as opposed to election officials who are sort of able to be there you, so on both sides, everybody gets to, when it's a When you have chosen the person to assist you, poll watchers are going to be curbed, and they're, going to, they're not going to allow you to see that. And so that's the other problem of, of assisted voting is that the poll watching is almost completely limited. Uh, you can't watch. You can't, I mean, you, you can be there, but they're not going to allow you to get near there. So, uh, and that's actually, am I right about that, Keith? I mean, I, I, that, that, there is a distinction between that. You have to understand that when they are being assisted by somebody individually, then you, you, you're you going to have to step away. Right. And, and you, uh, Im imagine you can't really observe very much. So your duties are really curtailed. Yeah. So I, I think to the issue, and, and we're uh, sadly at, at the end of our time together, I think that the one of the issues to the question about the, the national PSA, how many of you were in the lunch and saw the TPPF short documentary, that six minute documentary, okay? So that, you're the first people to see that. That, that, that was only made, the final cut was 24 hours ago. The foundation, because that's a nonpartisan message, we're going to be promoting that throughout Texas and the country and it, I would encourage all of you to share it. Put it out on your social media accounts. Uh, and as you see at the end, we're not asking for specific you know, action by bill. That's not something that we, we generally do uh, in this sort of a message. But we're saying contact your, your representative and ask what they're doing to ensure the integrity of the ballot and to, per to protect our elections against tampering. So that's one thing that you can do. I think the other, you've heard some things already here about 
your rights as a uh, poll watcher, especially if you've got a coordination from a candidate or from a party. Uh, you need to know uh, how, you know, how you can assist and in, 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 in increase the integrity of our elections. And then you've heard about some of the weaknesses that we have in Texas regarding vote by mail. And you can encourage your elected representatives to uh, seek ways to improve the ballot integrity here in Texas. And I think to that regard, there was legislation that did pass out of the Senate uh, this last session. Uh, and perhaps we can, we can see both houses of the Texas legislature uh, consider some of these reforms in the upcoming session next year. Uh, and, and perhaps some of you can show up and testify uh, in favor of some of those things. So uh, again, I appreciate greatly um, your attendance at, at both policy orientation and at this specific panel. Nice to see that we're standing room only. Thank you. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for your civic participation in this very important issue. Thank you.